worshiping an amazing God that does great things. So let's continue to sing to Him. Online. Hope you are having a great weekend or whenever you are checking this out, watching it on your computer, on a podcast. Uh, listen, we know it's Labor Day weekend, so there might be more people traveling, listening uh, from online than usual. We hope you are having a great time. Thank you so much for joining in with us. Listen, a few announcements here for you, some things to celebrate. One, 
middle school camp. Last weekend, we sent over 260 middle school students out to a camp. That is over double the amount of kids that we had just last year. And I'm telling you, my kids were actually there at the camp and they are still talking about what it is that God did. And so I just want to say one, thank you to all the volunteers and staff that made that happen. Two, thank you to you as the church who's been praying for our students. You know, if you've been around Hope, we are a place that wants to build families that thrive. And this opportunity to invest in our students is incredible. So thanks to God for what it is that he's doing there. Secondly, I want you to know we are continuing this week and wrapping up our series that we've been calling This Verse Changed My Life. Our good friend Ben Foote is in town from Flatirons Community Church all the way from Colorado. You are in for a treat with what it is that he has to share. And then before we get into that, I want to talk to you just for a moment about the series that we are kicking off next week. You might remember a few months back, we did a series that's called, that was called Made for More. And in that series, it was all about this idea that, man, as the church, there's so much more to our lives and what we're called into than just getting together in a physical space on the weekends. But we still have this hunch that there are men and women and students that are walking around not experiencing life the way that God intended. And so we're kicking off this series next week but along with that, we so believe in what it is that we're going to be covering over the next six weeks. We want you to engage with it, not just on the weekends by yourself, but also in groups. And so if you're in a small group, we're calling all of our small groups into an all play. If you're not in a group, we want to provide you with an opportunity to get involved in a campus table group. There's going to be information here online. I'm sure some of our volunteers are dropping it over in the chat, or maybe there's a QR code or a web address here uh, around the lower third. So click on that, get the information that you need. And I, I can't encourage you enough, man. We're so excited about this series. Engage in person and find a way to get into a group. Hey, listen, thank you again so much for being here with us this weekend. Let's continue to worship. I'm going to sing till my heart starts changing. Oh, and I'm going to worship till I mean every word. Because the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. I give you my worship, you still deserve it, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song, I pour out your praises, in blessing and breaking, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song. Like my king is risen Gonna preach to my soul That you've already won And even though I can't see it I'm gonna keep Say you are worthy. I'll never. 
never stop singing your praise. No, I'll never stop singing your praise. And when I finally see your face, I'll cry worthy. And when you singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise no I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise can we sing that chorus I give you my worship sing it with us I give you my worship and you still deserve it you're worthy you're worthy you're worthy of my song. I pour out my praises in blessing and breaking. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my song. So I give you my worship, and you still deserve it. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my song. I pour out your praises in blessing and breaking. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my song. All right, Hope, how are we doing today? We good? Nice. Hey, you don't know me yet. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a pastor from out in Boulder, Colorado at a church called Flatirons. Uh, to maybe give you a little context, if you've been attending Hope for a little while now, uh, you might be familiar with a guy named Jim Bergen who came out and taught a couple times. He's a big, ripped, bald dude. Not Jason, but a different big, ripped, bald dude. 
um, who's also a pastor. Uh, he's the lead pastor at Flatirons. He and I teach together out in Colorado. Um, you're about to hear a part of my story in, in detail, but some quick facts, rapid facts about me just so you can get to know me. Um, I'm 36. I've been a pastor for 10 years. I've been married for 13. And my wife, Allie, and I have three kids, ages 9, 7, and 4, which means I don't even remember what it's like to experience silence anymore. <laughs> Uh, my flight here was the quietest moment in the last nine years of my life, and it was a noisy flight. Um, but I, I think one thing that I would really want you to hear from me right off the bat at the very beginning is that I am a big fan of Hope Community Church from afar, but I've been a big fan of this church for a while now, and it's, it's because I can tell the heartbeat of this community is something special, and it's the same heartbeat that I have. Like, I believe that Jesus is for everyone, especially if you think you're too far gone, and I think a church should have wide open front doors that welcome everyone, and when you walk inside, you're going to see people with wide open arms welcoming everyone and I believe that it's a sin to make Jesus boring or confusing or inaccessible for people who don't understand him yet and you believe all the same stuff so we're basically two peas in a pod I think you're cool um, I, I do I pray for your church I, I really do I pray for your leaders Jason and the lead team I pray for your teachers you got Chase who's awesome and guys like Aaron and Dwayne your campus pastors I pray for you guys I'm rooting for you and I guess all I'm trying to say is like every Every other healthy relationship in your life, even though you don't know me, I've been stalking you guys online. So <laughs> it's actually true. But um, so I've gotten to know your lead pastor, Jason, over the last few months, um, who, by the way, is an incredible pastor. Don't take that man for granted. He's a leader who's both strong and humble, which is like really hard to find. And so next time you see him in the lobby or you see him at the grocery store at the next Mr. Universe competition or wherever that dude hangs out, go tell him you're thankful to have him as a leader. But Jason reached out to me. He asked if I wanted to teach. And when a leader like that asks you to teach at a church like Hope, you just say yes. And so I said yes, and I moved stuff around. And in fact, I was even supposed to be teaching at my church in Colorado this weekend, and I just bailed. Like, I don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> there might be people sitting in seats like waiting for me to show up. And the band's going like, let's play this chorus one more time. Where's Ben? Um, Jason told me the series that you're in, this verse changed my life. And so I've had this in the, the back of my mind for a few weeks ago, thinking about it. But it's been difficult for me to pick a verse because I'm one of those people. It's like I've got multiple verses that have drastically altered the course of my life. Like, I don't know if you've read the thing, but the Bible is dope. Like, <laughs> it's really good. Um, there's parts of it that even in context probably won't change your life. Stuff like genealogies, you know. Now, those are the long sections of the Bible where it's like so-and-so begat, so-and-so who begat. So everyone's begatting each other in those parts of the Bible. And all the names are confusing, like Mahalalel and Mephibosheth and Fuque, Verena, and like strange names <laughs> like that um, might not change your life. But for the most part, the book is a great book. And ultimately, I decided to teach on one of the most impactful verses in my life by far. It's a verse I think about nearly every single day. It is a verse that has held me together through life's hardest seasons, and it is a verse that has changed my understanding of the character and nature of Jesus, and that verse is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. All right, but to explain why it changed my life, I'm gonna ask you to bear with me for a few minutes because I've got to share a part of my story with you. All right, so I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Um, I grew up in a church-going family. I know that's not everyone's story, but that was my story. And my dad was really involved in this church. He was an elder at this church at one point, which is like the, the main, you know, he leads the lead pastor. And what that meant for me as a kid was that I was at church all of the time. I was there, you know, Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. My dad would take me to elders meetings on weeknights and I would run around the church building alone and steal communion and break into the baptism pool and stuff like that. And as a kid, it was fun. But then as I grew up, my eyes started to open to the type of community that I was a part of. And frankly, I just didn't like what I saw. My eyes opened and not in a good way. And hopefully you've never had this experience, but at the same time, I know a lot of us have. I was around 13, somewhere in there, when I first remember thinking for the first time at church, looking around, and I went, I don't like this place, and I don't like these people. 
And that's harsh. And, and now that I'm an adult, it's like, it, that's a blanket statement. And I can look back on my church and there were fantastic people at my church. But at the age 13, that's what it felt like. It was like, I don't like this place and I don't like these people. And what I didn't like was an, a, an apparent and obvious lack of honesty and vulnerability. Because right? I, I knew these people. I knew these people outside of church. It was a really small church. I knew them Monday through Saturday. And Monday through Saturday, it's like their marriages are falling apart and their kids are train wrecks and they're drinking too much and they're flirting with the secretary. But then on Sunday, they're blessed. That's how they said it in Texas. They're blessed, right? And, and they've like tucked their shirt in and they finally shaved and they're calling everyone brother and sister and they're talking about how perfect their lives are thanks to Jesus. And what I started to realize is these people are pretending. They're wearing masks. Like these people don't feel like they can be their true selves with other Christians, especially at church on Sunday. And then I started to realize that they expected that same thing out of me. They expected perfection. And I was one of those guys that's like, I know I'm a train wreck Monday through Saturday. I just don't feel like pretending on Sunday. And so I was exhausted with like this expectation that I'm supposed to be perfect and, and wear a mask. And this expectation that all Christians are supposed to be cleaned up with everything in order and perfect. And so what happened is I just, I never felt like I was enough. And I don't know if you felt like that, but I did. I never felt good enough or perfect enough or holy enough to fit in with other Christians. And then what happened, and maybe some of you have been there or you're here now, but what happened is I started to apply that mindset to Jesus himself. And so what I said was, if I'm not good enough to hang out around these other Christians, then that certainly means I'm not good enough to hang around Jesus if he's even real in the first place. And I made this dangerous connection in my brain. It's a connection that a lot of us have made throughout our lives. I told myself, if that's how Christians act, then it must be because that's how Jesus acts. And if that's how Jesus acts, then I want nothing to do with them. So around the age 15, 16, somewhere in there, I began a decade season, uh, long season of my life where I bailed on Jesus. I didn't want anything to do with him or his people. And that's mainly because I wanted nothing to do with pretending to be perfect and wearing a mask. And so I threw away the whole faith thing. I was like, I'm done with this. And I ended up convincing myself that Jesus and Christianity and God and the Bible, it's all just fairy tales, right? It's like, it's stories that humans invented because humans are scared to death of death. I was a real peach to be around, as you can tell. Uh, but then the final nail in the coffin of my faith happened my freshman year of college. And this was a season of my life where I was starting to put some puzzle pieces together from my life and I noticed this like lifelong trend of deep sadness for as long as I could remember and I, I just suddenly woke up one morning in my dorm room freshman year and I realized, oh, I have depression and I just realized it. And to, to let you know, like at the time on the surface level, my life's great. All right, I finally live a thousand miles away from home, which I really wanted to live far from home. And I lived far from home and I loved my school. I loved the friends I was making. I met Allie, who I was quickly falling in love with. I would eventually marry her. But it was like for all my life, even in the midst of really great things, there was always this like heavy, dark burden on my shoulders all of the time. And those of you with depression, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, we'll hear other people say stuff like, I'm really depressed this week because I broke up with my boyfriend. And we nod, but in our heads, we're like, no, you're just sad. <laughs> All right, you'll be over him in a week. And depression is different. And the reason that depression was a, a nail in the coffin of my faith is because the church that I grew up in, so meaning the only Christian context that I ever knew, in that context, you were not allowed to be a Christian with depression. Depression was a sin, right? Depression was a lack of faith. Depression meant that you didn't actually trust Jesus, and let's be honest, Jesus didn't actually love you enough to make you happy. In my church, depression and faith were incompatible with each other. If you said you had depression, Christians would get together behind your back and scheme ways to save you. <laughs> They'd be like, maybe he needs rebaptized at middle school camp or something. Or, or they go like, maybe he needs an exorcist. Who know, does anyone know any Catholics? Someone call the Catholics. <laughs> I, I realized in college I have depression and 
And what I immediately told myself was like, well, that's that. Right? I can close the door on Jesus for good now. Right? Any part of me that's even holding on to even just a thin thread of faith, that's gone now because to be a Christian, you've got to be perfect. And to be perfect, you've got to pretend. And if you have depression, you know, you just can't pretend. You can't wear a mask and cover that one up. And so over the next several years, my depression, it grew and it grew and so did my hopelessness and I was on this really dark path and now looking back, I can honest to God tell you that I do not think I would be alive today if I kept walking down that path and if it weren't for Jesus and not the version of Jesus that I grew up with but the real version of Jesus, the Jesus that we find in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And so let's dig into that verse together. I think context is important anytime we're going to understand the Bible. So quick context behind the book of 2 Corinthians is actually a letter written by a guy named Paul. And Paul, the author, is an apostle and he is the man. All right, he's a powerhouse of an individual. He used to be a bigwig Jewish religious leader. He used to actually persecute Christians. But then one day Jesus radically changes his life. Paul eventually becomes a Christian. And then not only a Christian, but he becomes one of the most influential missionaries to have ever lived and the author of most of the New Testament. All right, that's, that's Paul, the author. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who live in a city called Corinth. All right, Corinth is a city that still exists today. It's in Greece. But in Paul's time, ancient Corinth was notorious for being like a pretty immoral, nasty place. It was like the Las Vegas of the ancient world. And here's why this context is important for us today. It's this. Paul is a man with a past. All right, he's got like blood on his hands. He's got baggage. Right, and then he's writing to a group of people living in Corinth. They grew up in Corinth. And so it's a pretty safe bet to assume that these people have pasts. They've got skeletons in their closets. In other words, that means 2 Corinthians is a letter for us because we all have pasts and we all have baggage. And so Paul, as usual, he writes this beautiful letter. And in the first nine chapters, he talks about how God loves us and we're forgiven and God's going to keep his promises no matter what. And we can have hope in the midst of hardship, all this great stuff. And then in chapter 10, Paul takes a hard turn and he starts addressing some false teachers who were in Corinth. All right, these false teachers were dudes who claimed to be apostles, just like Paul, even though they weren't. And they're walking around Corinth and they're spreading lies about not only Paul, but lies about Jesus. And so in chapter 10, Paul takes his gloves off and he starts defending himself against these guys. And he sarcastically calls them super apostles. And he says they boast about themselves beyond proper limits. And at one point, he even says this. He says, for such men are false apostles, they're deceitful workmen, and they're masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And so it's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Now those are strong words, but here's what I think we should notice today. Three separate times, Paul uses the word masquerade. What is Paul's problem with these guys? Well, he's got several problems with them, but one of the problems that he's got with these guys is they masquerade. They wear masks. They're pretending. All right? They're pretending to be more righteous and more cleaned up and more perfect than they truly are, just like the church I grew up in, maybe even the church that you grew up in. And not only are they pretending to be perfect, but they're walking around and they're bragging about it. So they're going like, look how perfect we are. You should stop living that way that Jesus told you to. You should live like we live because it turns out if you live our way, you have a perfect life. So be more like us. And so in the last part of chapter 11, in the beginning of chapter 12, Paul gets tongue in cheek and he basically sarcastically tells the Corinthians, he goes, is that what you're interested in? Right, you're interested in a bunch of dudes wearing masks and pretending to be perfect and bragging about how they've all got it figured out? Okay, cool. If that's what you're into, then let me play a fool for a few minutes and I'll brag about myself. And then he starts boasting. But what's crazy is he doesn't boast about how he's got life figured out. Paul boasts about how much hardship he's seen in his life. 
Later today, you should really go read chapter 11 because he says some crazy stuff. Like he brags about how many times he's been arrested. He brags about how many times he's been whipped and beaten. He brags about how many times he's been stoned and not that kind of stoned, but like the sad kind of stoned. Um, I'm from Colorado, so I always have to clarify what kind of stoned Paul was. <laughs> or I'm gonna have a dude on the front row be like, Paul is stoned all the time? Rad, <laughs> whatever. So not that kind of stone. Uh, he brags about how he's been robbed multiple times. He brags about how his life has been threatened by starvation and sleep deprivation and hypothermia. He even brags that he's been shipwrecked three separate times, which is insane to me. It's like shipwreck me once, you know, shame on you. Shipwreck me twice, shame on me. Shipwreck me three times, like why do I keep getting in boats? <laughs> it's just foolish. Um, Anyway, he, he brags about all this crazy stuff that he's been through. It's like stuff that you could make a movie about, right? But then suddenly he changes his tone and he changes his tone in chapter 12, verse seven. And this is where I wanna zoom in together right now. Paul says this. He says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. He just talked about some crazy stuff that was revealed to him. He goes, to keep me from being conceited, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. He changes his tone here. Like be before this, he's been shouting and rambling and going on a tangent about crazy stuff like shipwrecks. And then suddenly in verse seven, it's almost like he leans in and he whispers and begins sharing a secret with us. It's almost like he goes, hey, you know, I've been talking about shipwrecks and all that stuff, but can I be real with you for a second? Because there's like this other thing that I'm, I'm going through and it's killing me. It almost feels like when my kids have a bad day, um, when I pick them up from school and any of us who are parents, you, you, you know what the situation's like. They're, I can tell they're off and so they get in the car and I'm like, hey, you doing okay? And they're like, I'm fine. And you're like... No, you're not. It's all right. You can tell me. You keep asking. And they're like, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm just hungry. I just scraped my knee at recess or whatever. It's like they're dancing around the problem. And then every now and then, if I keep asking, they'll finally just lean in. And they'll whisper. And their eyes will start to water up. And they'll say something like, I'm just afraid no one likes me. And it's like, well, that's what's really going on. Let's talk about it. That's how Paul feels in verse seven. Like he leans in and goes, well, here's what's like really going on. In the next verse, Paul leans in even more. He gets even more vulnerable. Look at this, he says this. He goes, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. All right, so Paul's got this thorn in his flesh, which is a metaphor, of course. He's got this part of his life that's tormenting him and it's causing him pain. And then he confides in us and he's brave enough to tell us, he goes, I, I've even been like begging God to take this thing away from me. Paul says that. Paul, like the absolute stallion of a missionary and Christian and man, Paul has something so dark, so heavy, so painful in his life that he's begging God for relief. And here's where we gotta take a time out. All right, because the Bible is not just a book written to a bunch of people from a long time ago. The Bible is a book written to us. And so we have to place ourselves in this situation. We have to ask ourselves, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, you've got something that's tormenting you and causing you pain? And have you ever begged and pleaded with God to like take something away from you? Have you ever like begged for healing and relief? Of course you have. We all have. If you're anything like me, you didn't pray for relief three times, you've prayed like three million times. What is that thing for you? I want you to actually think of it right now. What is the thing that you have begged and pleaded with God to take away from you? Think of it right now. It could be like me, like depression, or, or this could be anxiety, or it could be the thing from your past that haunts you, like the thing that you've done or the thing that was done to you. And this is like the addiction or the secrets that you don't feel like you can keep anymore, or it's the baggage from your family history or the, the, self, the crippling insecurity. Like, what is your thorn? I want you to think of it. This is the thing that, that you have convinced yourself disqualifies you from being a good dad or mom or spouse, friend, kid, leader, neighbor, you name it. This is the thing that you think disqualifies you from being a good man or a good woman. 
In fact, for some of us, this is the thing that got you kicked out of your last church and you're playing pretend here because you're trying to figure out if it's gonna get you kicked out of hope. And then for others of us, like for those of you who are on the fence with Jesus and you're not sure what you think about Jesus right now, first of all, welcome. You're in the right place. You can stop church shopping. You found your place. No one's gonna be pushy. You can sit in the back in the dark and not talk to anyone while you investigate Jesus. I encourage you to do that here. Right? But if, if that's you and you're on the fence with Jesus, chances are your thorn is one of the reasons you're on the fence. Because you're going like, even if Jesus was real, there's no way he could put up with me because of fill in the blank. What is your thorn? What have you begged and pleaded for God to erase from your story? And now that you have that in mind, let's look at the next verse. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the verse that changed my life, turned my worldview upside down and played a key role in leading me back to Jesus. And before we read it together, if you've got one of those Bibles that's like Jesus' words are in red, you'll notice that these are some of the few red letters that you'll find outside of the four gospels. So this is Jesus himself speaking. Jesus himself replying to Paul's begging and pleading. And you know what we want. I know what I want. I want Jesus to say, yes, yes, of course, Paul. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't paying attention. And, and of course, you've been such a faithful servant. I'm gonna take this thing away from you. You've earned it. We want him to say, yes. What does he say instead? Look at this. But he, Jesus, said to me, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. We want, I want Jesus to say, yes. Yeah, sure, I'll take that thing away from you. I'll take away your thorn. But what does he say instead? Like Paul is begging and pleading for God to remove his suffering and Jesus replies, no. And not just no, he says, no, but. My grace is sufficient for you, which means I'm not gonna take it away from you, but I'm also not gonna let it crush you. He goes, my grace is sufficient for you and actually my power is going to be made perfect through your thorn. What is Paul's response to Jesus? Because that's not what I wanted to hear. I'm assuming that's not what Paul wants to hear. But here's Paul's response. He's, next few verses, he goes, Therefore, because of what Jesus said to me, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties. For, because when I am weak, then somehow I am strong. Remember, Paul is a man with real suffering. He's got real baggage. He's talking to a group of people who have real suffering and real baggage. And there's these fake apostles walking around and they're masquerading. They're wearing masks. They're pretending like they've got their whole lives figured out. And so now these Christians in Corinth are starting to worry. They're like, well, I'm not as perfect as him. And so maybe Jesus isn't for me because I'm broken and I'm messed up. And Paul basically says, don't listen to those guys. They're pretending and you, God's people, don't have to pretend. Paul says it's okay if you're still broken and messy. He says, I'm still broken and messy. But even in our brokenness and in our weakness, Jesus' grace is sufficient for us and his power will be made perfect through our thorns, through our weaknesses. My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Why did those words from Jesus change my life? Well, for me, it's because I, I spent a lifetime with Christians who were masquerading. They were wearing masks and, and they believed that Jesus expected perfection out of them. And so they pretended to be perfect. And it was all fear-based, right? Like they were all just convinced that Jesus was constantly disappointed in them and like constantly disgusted with their past and their baggage and their weaknesses and their suffering. And so they played pretend. I, I, I did not grow up in the kind of environment where I, I thought that Jesus' grace was sufficient for me and his power was made perfect in weakness. I grew up in the kind of environment where I thought Jesus' grace would be taken from me if he couldn't show off his power through my perfection. But then thank God, I encountered the real Jesus 
And it was after Allie and I were married and we moved to Colorado and I was working at a magazine at the time and I was aimless and lost and confused and hopeless and my depression was becoming unbearable. And in the same season, Allie wanted to start going to church and I was just like, fine, whatever, and I'll go with her. And for the first time in my life, I heard pastors who were broken people, but they just admitted their brokenness. And they were very honest about how Jesus has a lot of work to do in their lives, but they were committed to letting Jesus do the work. And I found a community of Christians who thought and felt the same way. And I just like, I wanted more of that. And I got swept into it. And then I started reading the Bible again through a whole new lens. And this verse just leapt off the page at me. And for the first time in my life, I realized that when Jesus sees my brokenness and my pain and my suffering and baggage, like when Jesus sees my depression, he doesn't look at me and say, say, hey, Ben, get your act together. Instead, he says, hey, Ben, I want that part of you, so give it to me, because I can work with that. And it was like all this beautiful stuff about Jesus started to click for the first time in my life. And I realized he wasn't expecting perfection out of me. That's why he was perfect for me. And Jesus isn't asking me to earn his grace. He paid for it. He's asking me to receive it. And I started to realize, like Dwayne talked about last weekend, it's because God so deeply loved the world that he sent us Jesus. Not because God so deeply wanted to put us on a lifelong spiritual pass or fail exam, right? Like pass, you go to heaven, fail, you go to hell. And not because God so desperately wanted to put us on a lifelong existential guilt trip, wagging his finger in your chest, going, look at what you made me do to my very own son. I realized, no, it's because of God's great love for me that he gave me Jesus so that I could be forgiven and redeemed and restored into a relationship with him. And I started to realize that a big part of a relationship with Jesus is Jesus looking at my brokenness and saying, trust me with that. Give it to me. I can work with that. And so slowly but surely, because old habits die really hard, I eventually became honest and vulnerable with myself and with Jesus and with other people. And eventually I I handed Jesus my depression and I asked him, Jesus, can you work with this? And he said, yes. Yeah, I can work with that. And this is where I gotta be real clear. Right, because a lot of churches and a lot of pastors and a lot of Christians, they really like stories that wrap up all neat and tidy with a perfect little bow at the end. It's like, and then I was healed. And I like skip off into a rainbow or something. And so please hear me. All right. Fast forward 10 years from that season of my life where Jesus started to make sense for the first time, 10 years until now. And here's the million dollar question. Did Jesus heal me of my depression? And the answer is no. Here's the follow-up question. Do I still feel aimless, lost, confused, and hopeless? And the answer is no. Why? Because I am one of millions of people who can say from personal experience, his grace has been sufficient for me. And his power is being made perfect in my weakness. And I'll be honest, I'm not going to lie to you. Like there's days, plenty of days where I wake up in the morning and I still beg and plead for God to take the thing away from me. But so far his answer has remained, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. And at the same time, in a strange, totally backwards way, I've watched Jesus turn my depression. And I almost can't believe I'm saying this out loud right now. Like he's turned my depression into a gift in my life. Like he keeps me dependent on him day in and day out. And it makes me more empathetic and tenderhearted for people who are suffering because I'm suffering. And it makes me a better husband and a better father. And it makes me a better pastor because I'm telling you, dude, if Jesus can work with my thorns, he can work with yours, I promise. And in a, in a crazy way, If Jesus were to somehow, I don't know, pull a magic trick, hit pause on my life and scoot the chair back and show me the outline of my life and explain to me that depression is the only way that I get to where I am today, then hands down, I would purposely choose depression every single time. And it's only because I can say that his grace has been sufficient for me and his power is being made perfect in my weakness. Listen, Hope Community Church, Listen to me, Jesus wants the real you, the real you, all of you, good, bad, and ugly. You can take the mask off. You don't have to pretend. I mean, your name is Hope 
community church. You're supposed to be a community of hope. What is the hope that we have to share with the world? Well, the hope is that Jesus can love and redeem and display his power through broken, messy, confused people like me and like you. That is the hope that you have to share with the triangle. And, and Jesus isn't asking for your perfection, right? He's asking for your weakness. He's asking for your baggage. He's asking for your brokenness. He's asking for your thorns because he wants to show off through those things. And so you're free to stop pretending and you can stop masquerading and you can stop living in the shame that comes from hiding your brokenness. It was never healthy to begin with because here's the truth. Jesus will not, like Jesus refuses to, love the false version of yourself that you display to the people around you. He won't love that version of you because it's not the real you. He loves the real you. And I know because I'm a real human being and a real broken, messy one. I know that the real you is messy and complicated and broken. But at the same time, the real you is the only version of yourself that is covered by grace, forgiven, justified, redeemed, loved, and adopted into the family of God. Only the real version of you, thorns included, suffering included, is a co-heir with Christ to the kingdom of God. So take off the mask and stop pretending. Hand Jesus your brokenness. The, this church, all right, and then my church back, back home in Colorado and then God's like worldwide capital C church was not designed to be a community of like clean cut, cookie cutter Christians who say all the right things and they've never struggled a day in their life. It's not what it was designed to be. God's church is designed to be a group of messy, broken people who are rough around the edges, but by the grace of God, each day we're being made a bit more whole. The theological fancy word for that is sanctification. You and I are being sanctified, which means like slowly over time from now until the day that we die, we're being made whole. But sanctification for normal people who didn't go to school for this, like me, basically means Christians are supposed to be a group of people who can stand tall with your heads held high and raise your hands and proudly say, I'm so screwed up that God himself has to fix me. And it's even gonna take him the rest of my life. <laughs> That's sanctification. You can boast in that. I can boast in that. Paul boasted in that. It's like, are we perfect? No. If you knew me, or you can already tell, like certainly not you, <laughs> right? Are we there yet? No. Are we on our way? You better believe it. Why? Well, because Jesus looked at my mess and he looked at your mess and he said, I can work with that. That is not the version of Jesus I grew up with, but it is the real version of Jesus, and he's so good. Like, he's so much better than we usually give him credit for. And again, one more time, for any of you who are on the fence with Jesus, especially if you're on the fence with Jesus because you grew up, like, maybe getting burned by a church or getting burned by Christians, I'm begging you, like, please don't give up on Jesus just because you had a bad experience with church or Christians. Please don't. Like, that, that's as crazy as saying, like, I've given up on ever trying or tasting, like, a perfectly marbled, medium-rare T-bone steak fresh off the grill because one time in seventh grade I threw up inside of a steak and shake. And it's like, what? <laughs> uh, dude, it's got steak in the name, but it's not serving the real deal, <laughs> all right? And the church that burned you might have had Jesus or Christian in the name, but it wasn't serving you the real deal. And the real deal, Jesus, is so good, don't give up on him just because us Christians can just suck sometimes. Hope Community Church isn't perfect, all right? But at the same time, let's be honest, you didn't want it to be in the first place. You wanted this place to be a collection of messy, broken, rough around the edges people who stopped pretending. And, and you as a collective like whole, you have the power to make this community exactly that, a place of honesty and vulnerability, a place where you don't have to pretend, a place where Jesus displays perfect power through great weakness. I'm just here as Colorado, from Colorado as a friend to encourage you to make that a reality. I'm here to encourage you to take off the mask and hand Jesus and your community your brokenness because that's when he gets to work. And I've gotten to experience that. And I'm telling you, once you live that way, there's no going back. It's such a good way to live your life. And so we're going to end. And, and here's what I'm going to ask that you do. I'm going to ask that you stand up.
I'm about to pray and then we'll, we'll sing one more song together. But before we do, before we do that, I would be honored as just a friend from out of town to read a section of Romans 8 over you today. This is also written by Paul. These verses are some of the most victorious verses you'll find in all of scripture. And it's like a battle cry, like the series that you guys recently did. It's not a battle cry for people who are perfect. It's not a battle cry for people who are trying to pretend to be perfect. It is a battle cry for like true grit, hope filled Christians for thousands of years now. It's a reminder that we're banged up and we're broken and we're messy and we're complicated, but also because of Jesus, we are redeemed and forgiven and marching toward inevitable victory that was sealed for us. And as I read this, I want you to think of your thorn. All right, the thing that, that, that burdens you and causes you pain and you've been begging and pleading with God to take it from me and Jesus is looking at you going, give it to me. I can work with that. I want you to think of that thorn as I read these verses and I want you to ask yourself a question. Do I really believe that Jesus can work with this thorn of mine? So Paul writes this, this is Romans 8. He goes, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, what could possibly get in the way between you and the love of Christ, which is the hope of the world? Can trouble separate you from the love of Christ? Can hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, I'll add to that, can your suffering separate you from the love of Christ? Do you, do you really think that your grief or your sin or your doubt or your deconstruction or your depression or your divorce or your trauma or your anger can separate you from him? Like, do you really think that there's anything in your past, present or future that can separate you from the love of Christ? Do you believe that? Like, do you really believe that your thorn can separate you from the love of Christ? Paul answers that. He goes, no, no. And in fact, in all these things, thorns and suffering included, he goes, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says, I'm convinced, like I'm positive that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present today nor the future to come, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, thorns included, will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Pray with me. God, uh, thank you for this time together right now. God, I know there's some people watching online and there's some people sitting here right now and we've been begging and pleading with you for a really long time to take some stuff away. And you keep saying no. And it's painful and it hurts. But God, maybe for some of us for the first time today, we're just starting to realize, well, you say no, but. You say no, but my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. God, what I'm asking for is an extra ounce of courage and bravery for anyone who has been wearing the mask and they want to take the mask off and they want to just like maybe just say it out loud finally for the first time to someone they trust or to, to one of their pastors, God, would you give us an extra ounce of courage and bravery so that we can hand you and others our brokenness so that your power can be made perfect through it. God, I thank you for who you are. Like, you don't always give us the answer that we want right away, but you always give us the answer that we need. And, and so I thank you, God. And I thank you for every single person who's watching online. God, I thank you for every single person in a campus. I, God, I thank you for the people sitting on the front row who came prepared and brought their Bibles. And I thank you for the people sitting in the back in the dark trying to hide because not a single one of us is too far gone. And we're not too far gone because of what your son did for us. And it's in his holy name that I pray. Amen. God's grace, God's grace is sufficient for us. Man, Ben, thank you so much for that great message. Hey, listen, if you're just trying to figure out, man, what is my next step in my faith journey? We would love to come alongside of you and help you figure out what that is. We've got a website set up for you, gethope.net slash next. It should be over in the chat, but click on that or just raise your hand and ask for one of our volunteers. They would love to come alongside of you and point you in the right direction. Hey, we're also encouraging everyone, even our .TV folks online to celebrate communion this week. 
And I know that celebrating communion at home, it might be a different thing. We've got a website set up for you as well, gethope.net slash communion at home. Head on over there and it'll just walk you through uh, some things that you can consider, some things to process and to reflect and to celebrate as ultimately as we as followers of Jesus, remember who Jesus is and celebrate what it is that he's done for us. Listen, don't forget we are kicking off a brand new series next week, Made for More. Can't wait to see you. Join with us in person. But if not, we'll see you right back here on gethope.tv.